Recently, I debated a Christian apologist over whether Christianity was dangerous. If you didn't see that debate, the summary is that I showed numerous examples of how Christian clergy, politics, philosophy, and doctrine were all individually dangerous, even in tiny doses. But contrary to my opponent's objection, I wasn't arguing that Christians were dangerous. I argued that Christianity was dangerous, as all religions are. I'm going to stop you right there. Because if you're going to say we were arguing Christianity is dangerous, then you need to follow the logical formula provided. You cannot just commit an association fallacy, as you did in the debate, and think random examples of Christians being bad means Christianity caused this bad behavior. But that is all you did, and presented no empirical data Christianity actually caused this bad behavior. As I explained in psychology, this is called an attribution error. A little more is needed than finding associations and running wild. And that one is particularly dangerous because it prohibits free thought, makes one susceptible to deception by design, and because the doctrine itself is misleading and teaches dangerous things with detrimental effects. And where are the peer-reviewed studies that show this, Aaron? You didn't provide sufficient data to demonstrate this, which was my point and why I cited three pages worth of studies to show the opposite is demonstrable. The bibliography link is below, because you didn't take the papers I offered you. Even though we both know a friend of mine named Matthew walked over to you after the debate and offered the papers to you, and you still didn't take them. All you did was present what you think Christianity causes, and assume this was the case without sufficient empirical data. That's not how it works. If you make the positive claim that Christianity causes something harmful, you need to show evidence that there is actually a positive association or a causal link. Random attribution errors don't cut it. Even the slightest acceptance of Christianity still requires some denial of natural science, even if it's just making believe things that are not evidently or even possibly true, like the soul, for example, because you have to believe that or else. You'll face the empty threat of a fate worse than death if you don't make yourself believe. There's a definite danger to your ability to reason if you've been conditioned that what that you must believe man-made mythology of impossible absurdity and for no good reason, even when all the evidence says otherwise. Christianity is dangerous to children because they're told that they're born defective and need to ask forgiveness for even being born at all and that they'd better not think, think rationally about that or they'll burn in hell. Intellectually damaging child abuse. My opponent erroneously dismissed my entire argument as if it was all irrelevant. <sighs> because it was. I relied on scientific studies, not my personal experience, personal feelings, or cherry-picked examples. Which, sadly, was essentially your opening statements, and very little data was cited. And ironically, the data he provided for his side was largely irrelevant to the question we were debating. Why? Why is citing studies on intrinsic religiosity that draw heavily on sample sizes that utilize Christians irrelevant to the topic at hand? Did you even listen to my talk? I noticed several viewers' comments describing his argument as a dodge tantamount to the no true Scotsman fallacy. Why is citing peer-reviewed studies that look at intrinsic religiosity a dodge? Also, throwing around the no-true-Scotsman fallacy without justification is a bad argument. The no-true-Scotsman fallacy is meant to be used for arguments that dismiss members of a group over arbitrary reasons. Take one of the original examples. You are only a true Scotsman if you eat your porridge a certain way. But the obvious problem is such an act is arbitrary to what it means to be a Scotsman. However, if someone born in Germany and has no Scottish heritage and pretends they are a Scotsman, it is not fallacious to say they aren't, because you're not dismissing their claim on arbitrary reasons, but on sufficient reasons. This should be obvious. And likewise, if someone claims to be a Christian and doesn't follow core doctrines of what it means to be a Christian, it is not a fallacy to point out they are only a Christian in name. As I was trying to explain to you at the end of the cross-examination, if a self-proclaimed humanist went around killing religious people in the name of humanism, you would obviously, and rightly so, say they were not a real humanist. Because they are doing things that go against core tenets of humanism. Why can't the same logic apply when it is the other side? He also criticized me for things I never said, and he ignored much of what I did say. Aaron, you said in a past debate 
So you're encouraged to believe without evidence. You're expected to accept to uh, accept that Thomas saw evidence, so you don't need to. Because Christianity depends on a lot of irrational, illogical gullibility where you're supposed to believe what you're told without question, without reservation, and without reason. So Christianity never promotes critical analytical skepticism. Instead, it says you'll be damned if you dare to question the existence or identity of your tribal God. And then I put the exact lines up in timestamp so everyone knew what I was addressing. You strongly imply Christianity doesn't promote analytical thinking or skepticism and promotes the opposite. So I addressed your claim with studies, which show there is no correlation as you suggested. I never said you said Christianity causes stupidity. Instead, I quoted you directly in your own words and responded to what you have argued for. For example, when I pointed out that Jesus himself promoted dangerous superstitious pseudoscience as well as racism, slavery, and estranging families for the sake of his cult, my opponent said that was just Christians behaving badly, as if Jesus is only human and an embarrassingly ignorant and poorly behaved Christian, and that I shouldn't judge Christianity based on the Christ. I didn't say that at all. If I did, it would have been easy for you to put that in your response video. But you didn't, and we both know why, because I never said that. I pointed out this is cherry-picking verses out of the New Testament, assuming there is only one interpretation of these verses and assuming this somehow has damaging effects, even though there are no empirical studies to support this claim. When I pointed out how Christian doctrine commands that queer folk should be murdered simply for being LGBTQ, my opponent said that it was unfortunate that some Christians interpret the Bible to mean what it says. Again, it doesn't say that, and you're just putting words in my mouth. I gave a rational exegesis of the text and what Christians are actually commanded to do. As if we can't judge Christianity over what it actually teaches, either. So from my perspective, my opponent's argument seemed to be that Christianity isn't dangerous so long as you don't really believe too much of it, or if you ignore what the scriptures say, that just believing is safe enough if you don't act on that belief. As long as you limit your religion to community unity, you're probably fine, depending on which church it is, and as long as you ignore other religious communities, too. So I came out of that debate thinking I had obviously won hands down and that my opponent simply failed to perform. I still think that. But of course Christians say the Christian won because they overlooked everything that he overlooked, which I think is typical. But there was one thing I said in that debate that got a lot of backlash in subsequent posts and videos, and that was this. Faith is not just a synonym of trust. It's a belief that is based on logical fallacies, arguments from authority, or subjective impressions. Anything but scientific evidence. To my experience, many Christians will admit that faith is a belief that is not based on evidence. Well, hold on. Are you serious? Because in the debate you said, and I quote, And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. So which is it, Aaron? Do all Christians tell you you're defining faith wrong? Or do Christians define faith as you do? I'm not going to skip ahead to places that are relevant to save time, but I want to stop here to just hone in on how ridiculous this video is. Aaron cites several definitions of faith here. None of them are experts on the New Testament and the meaning of faith as it was defined in Koine Greek, but for some reason Aaron cites the Devil's Dictionary, a satirical dictionary, as if it was a legitimate source. I already pointed out in the debate, this is not a reliable source. It was meant to be a satire. I'm not sure what Aaron thinks he's doing by putting these definitions up on the side constantly. Many of the citations are just fallacious appeals to authority, being they are not experts. The ones that are credible sources are just talking about faith as defined in English, not the Greek word pistis. But let's skip ahead now, because a lot of what follows is just ranting and examples from his personal experience, so nothing worth addressing. Some believers try to argue that every authoritative or definitive source I could cite has it wrong, either saying that faith doesn't have to be independent of evidence, or worse, they'll turn it completely around and say that faith is based on evidence. I'm going to stop here because I want to clarify something. I never asked what faith means, because in English, that can have different meanings. What I was interested in was what does the Greek word pistis mean? Do you have any scholars that specialize in Koine Greek to say pistis means denying evidence or reason? Because that is the actual term used in the New Testament. That is what is relevant, since that is what Christianity teaches. Arn will get to this later on, but I want to clarify before we get there, since I never said faith cannot mean something else in English. I was interested in what does the ancient Greek word pistis mean. 
They want to pretend that faith is rational when it isn't, or that they have evidence when they don't. No, Aaron, that is not what we said. As I told you, and as Tyler Vella told you twice, faith is not about rational inquiry. It is an act of volition. It is about confidence or loyalty. It is something you do after you reason. This has been explained to you time and time again. And every Christian I've ever debated this with tells me that I'm misdefining faith. All right, let's just move on. But let's take a look at what that evidence always turns out to be. Starting with logical fallacies, there is the God of the gaps, such that whatever you think science hasn't or can't explain is somehow explained by magic. This, ironically, is nothing but a fallacious argument. And I did a whole video response a year ago explaining why this is just circular reasoning and assuming the naturalistic or materialistic conclusions you want. The point is that anything that is not explained by science is unexplained. It doesn't mean it is, is explained by God. So is math unexplainable since it is not explained by science? These are elements of scientism seeping into Aaron's reasoning, even though he denies he holds to scientism. Science doesn't explain everything, like philosophy of science. You cannot find the scientific method through science. You have to assume the scientific method. And I did not argue if something isn't explained by science, it is explained by God. In my videos, I argue there is good data to make an inference to theism. Trying to reduce all arguments to this straw man just shows you're not even trying to listen. The gaps in our knowledge are not evidence of any God. Every time we've ever blamed anything on the supernatural, it turned out to be wrong. And the real explanation was always a revelation of whole new fields of study previously unimagined and far more complex than the mystical excuses we made up in our ignorance. That is not true. Contingency and moral arguments have been around since Plato and have not been adequately explained in naturalistic terms. Even some atheists have pointed this out. Plus, most of the modern arguments for God's existence rely on recent data. There is no indication science is burying God. More data has only strengthened the theistic arguments. Plus, this is just an induction fallacy. Another fallacious argument from Aaron. Ironic, since he says all arguments for God's existence are fallacious. The God of the gaps is often used in conjunction with another fallacy called shifting the burden of proof. Believers hate the burden of proof more than vampires hate garlic, and they will push it far away, as if I have to disprove every empty assertion of impossible absurdity rather than expect them to justify their claims like any honest person would. Right, which is why I provided evidence for my positive claims in the debate. Now can you do the same to support your claim Christianity is dangerous? Cherry-picked examples from your experience are not good enough. Let's skip ahead because this just goes on and on with the same flaws in his reasoning and he attacks things I never claimed. On screen we have some more cherry-picked verses taken out of context. As I said in the debate, I did a whole video addressing this tactic of quote mining. Aaron then just gives more examples from his personal experience. So let's skip ahead to an actual relevant point. And they may say, I know for a fact that it's true, but no, you don't. A fact is objectively verifiable, and knowledge is demonstrable with measurable accuracy. It doesn't matter how convinced you are. Belief doesn't equal knowledge. Yeah, and again, as we told you, we never said faith meant that. Faith is an act of volition. Let me just quote Tyler Vella from your debate with him directly. It's trying to win by definitional fiat, by saying things like, well, faith is just believing the things that you know ain't so. That's just not what faith is. That's, again, not how we define what faith is. That's the atheist saying, let me define for you what your view is. Look, if we define it this way such that your view is false, then surprise, surprise, your view is false. Again, that's simply question begging. That's just not what biblical faith is. Faith, on the biblical view, is not anything we've heard today. It's not an act of the intellect. It's not actually a belief. It's an act of volition. It's an act of trust. And this has been shown over and over again. If you can't verify the accuracy of your claims to any degree at all, by any means whatsoever, then you cannot actually know what you merely believe. Good. Now do that with your claim that Christianity is dangerous. Go through the data and provide evidence to support your claim. If you know Christianity is dangerous, provide empirical evidence. Anecdotal cases and your personal feelings don't qualify as evidence. By the way, the paper you cited by the paleontologist Gregory Paul is riddled with problems, and I explain that here and in my debate with Matt Dillhunty. Some believers ignore how the word faith is actually used, and they taunt me as if I didn't know what the Greek word pistis meant, which also happens to be the base word of a pistivist, meaning one who is without faith. 
My friend Bionic Dance made up that word, and I provided the symbol to represent it. So, of course, as an epistivist myself, I understand that pistis meant belief, trust, or confidence. As some say, persuasion. Actually, it turns out to include uh, trust and trustworthiness, along with faith and faithfulness, too, presumably in different contexts. I don't know. It's all Greek to me. Even though these are all different words with very different implications in English, and only one of them means belief without evidence, the emphasis on all of them in the cited context is loyalty, that we are to trust, believe, or be persuaded by what we are told, simply because we're told to. That alone implies that it should be taken on authority rather than on evidence. No, Aaron. Being told to believe something just because we are told is not inherent in the Greek word pistis. What is your source for this? No ancient Greek scholar says this, as far as I'm aware. The word just refers to what you have on the screen. It is about trust, loyalty, or confidence. Nothing in the word includes believing just because you were told to. I think you just made that up to save your argument. So when my opponent asked me, All right, do you have any scholars that specialize in Koine Greek to say pistis means denying evidence or reason? The question made no sense. No one would say that persuasion, trust, or belief should be defined as denying evidence or reason. Okay, then stop saying things like what you just said a few minutes ago. And that's why faith really is an assertion of unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended against all reason. In the debate, I was just paraphrasing the definition you keep asserting for faith, which is why earlier I put your actual words on the screen. But again, it was not about one of the multiple ways faith can be defined in English. It was and still is about what the Greek word means, and never once does it mean an assertion of unreasonable conviction assumed without reason and defended against all reason. If I am wrong, where is your source? Pistis really just means what's on the screen right here. Especially not without a qualifier as to what is denying this. Not even when the context always implies that you should be persuaded to trust what I say and believe it simply because I said so. We took one original Greek word and turned its usage into a few different English words. In different citations, pistis may be used as belief, or as faith, or as persuasion, or trustworthiness. So although words like conviction would be defined in exactly the same way, whether that conviction is rational or irrational is determined by how it is used in that example. Yeah, exactly. And if the New Testament writers use the word pistis, and it doesn't actually mean how you define the English word faith, then you cannot say Christianity was ever meant to encourage this odd definition you keep using. Importantly, we don't have to say that it's not based on evidence if evidence is never mentioned as even being relevant. Again, Aaron, pistis is just about loyalty or confidence. Your confidence can be because of good evidence or it cannot be. Anytime someone says they have faith or are loyal, that doesn't always mean they have to explain why. If I said I have faith in my wife and I love her, I don't always have to explain why that is the case. If someone doesn't, you don't get to automatically assume their pistis is not based on evidence. All they said was they have faith, but that doesn't say how they got to that faith. It is arrogant and rude to assume that faith is always a lack of evidence. That's what this comes down to. This is the core of the conflict between science and religion being faith as contrasted with reason. Faith being contrasted with reason is a made-up conflict, especially since you just admitted faith can just mean loyalty or trust. Do you have confidence or faith in your reason? These are not terms that were ever meant to be in conflict. Let's skip ahead over the baseless attacks to get to another relevant point to save time. Again, I don't care about him citing examples from his experience. In this section, he again performs bad hermeneutics on Hebrews 11 and other passages, which again, I have already addressed. Pistis is never once in the Bible defined to mean one has to believe without or regardless of evidence. Quote mining a bunch of verses and ignoring the context and other verses where Christians are told to reason and believe on evidence is nothing more than a fallacious argument. My critics say that I should limit my use of the word faith to the way pistis was used in the New Testament, even though that word has multiple meanings in different contexts. No, Aaron, we didn't say that. We said you need to show places pistis is used to mean believing what you are told just because you are told. It was never defined that way. It just refers to loyalty, confidence, or trust. This is why I looked at other ancient works to see if it was ever used in the way you say it is, and that never comes up. 
This is not complicated, and in the Bible, it is just used the same way as confidence or trust in God. Not confidence in God without reason. Equivocation is the logical fallacy of mixing definitions or context with deceptive effect. For example, when I told Ray Comfort that I didn't believe anything on faith, he asked if I had faith in my wife, and he said that I must have faith that a plane won't crash before I board it. What he's talking about there is trust in evident probabilities based on past experience and so on. That's an evidence-based belief, not faith. Religious faith cannot equate to that, although some believers can't seem to understand that. Why? Why can't we simply have trust in God, and that is what we mean by pistis? You may not agree with the reasons we use to get to that trust, but it is fallacious and rude to say religious faith cannot just mean trust, when that is what pistis means and no scholar says it means trust or faith without evidence. Contrary to what my critics want to believe, faith is not simply a synonym of trust. It definitely is, and there is no scholarly source that says faith, as pistis, has a different meaning in a religious context. Once again, you have no scholarly support when it comes to pistis. It takes both a prefix and a suffix to turn trust into faith. Faith is a complete trust that is not based on evidence. Where is pistis defined this way? What is your source? You claim this, but then provide no sources which say this is what pistis means. The citations you keep putting up on the side either don't have proper references, so we cannot check the context, and many are from non-scholarly sources, satire, are talking about the English meaning of faith in different areas. I can only assume you just made this definition of pistis up, and again, why in your 20 years of research do you still have no primary sources or scholars who say this is what pistis means? You just made up a definition of pistis that is not demonstrable in any ancient work. You quote mine verses to support this, but in doing so when you interpret them, you assume faith means rejecting evidence, so therefore these verses have to mean denying evidence or reason, which is circular. And then, you want to turn around and say we don't have evidence, at the same time setting up an unreasonable standard of what constitutes as evidence. If you want to say this is what faith means in the Bible, then show a place it has to mean believing just because you are told to believe it. I cannot find one place it means this outside of the biblical text or in the biblical text. It just refers to loyalty or trust, which you even had to admit is the definition. There is not much more to say here. If Oren cannot accept basic definitions, it is not worth my time to reason with him more on this or related topics. But just to show how uncharitable he is being, let's look at one of his own definitions. Oren hates it when people don't accept his definition of atheism. He has even written a whole blog post on how he defines atheism. But when it comes to a religious person, defining what they mean by faith, well, he gets to tell us what we mean by that word. I wish he would extend the same courtesy he only asks of us.